Hi, and welcome to today's presentation, Deputy Ship, the Financial Transition from Child to Adults. So I'm Chantelle, I head up the Court of Protection team, and I'm going to give you just a brief introduction about Wilkin Chapman, just so you know who we are. Uh, and then we're going to touch briefly on DWP appointees before going into lasting powers of attorney, deputy ship applications, principles of the Mental Capacity Act, what's involved with deputy ship management, doles and Section 21A proceedings from a financial position, as well as legal aid and who may be eligible. So we'll also have questions at the end if anybody um, wants to ask anything. So if you just pop the questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A box, we'll address these at the end if we haven't already addressed these throughout. So if you don't want your name to be known, there is an option for you to be um, classed as an anonymous attendee. Um, and the webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website shortly after the presentation today. So just to introduce ourselves and Wilkin Chapman, we're the largest law firm in Lincolnshire and East Yorkshire with an unrivaled breadth and depth of expertise and experience. We have 400 people located across four offices in Lincolnshire, and we provide trusted legal advice to both businesses and private clients based locally, nationally and internationally. We offer a wide range of private and business services. All of these can be seen on the screen now. So we have a specialist quarter protection team. Like I said, I'm Chantelle, I head up the team and I'm based in Lincoln. We have Keegan, who is a solicitor in the Grimsby team. And we have Hannah and Abby, who are both paralegals in the Lincoln team with me. So if we have a look at who we work with, we work with a range of individuals and these can include family members who wish to be appointed as finance or health and or health deputy, um, people who are going through dolls hearings, possibly contested deputyship applications, family members who may feel that their the finances of their loved one is a little bit too complex for them to manage. Um, or it could be where a deputy has mismanaged the funds of their loved one who they're acting for, and they're now going through proceedings to be discharged as deputy as well. We also work with social workers like yourselves. Often that's when we're looking, when your clients are looking for a deputy or attorney to act, where they don't have friends or family that are able or willing to act. We work with care homes who sometimes refer work to us, independent financial advisors who have clients who have either lost or are in the process of losing capacity, as well as clinical negligence, brain injury and personal injury solicitors where a deputy is required as part of their proceedings. So we're increasingly coming across parents and children who've not been informed of the deputyship process as part of preparing for adulthood. So this results in young people who end up having no access to funds once they reach 18. So no one's got any authority to manage their finances. Parents, once their child reaches 18, are immediately shut out of any financial decisions because their parental responsibility ends once they get to 18 years old. You may have heard in the news recently about frustrated families that um, are no longer able to access their child trust fund or their, their child's junior ISA because their child who lacks capacity is now over 18 and no authority has been obtained to access this. So it's become clear that the root cause of parents not being able to access these funds was the current deputyship application process with it being so lengthy and a lack of awareness of the Mental Capacity Act too. So many people lacked awareness of the need to obtain authority such as a deputyship order in order to access funds and the steps that are involved with making decisions on behalf of their child once they reach 18. So the current court application process was also felt to be disproportionately lengthy and costly given the amounts of money that we were talking about. So to address the root causes, instead of amending the Mental Capacity Act, the Ministry of Justice states that they will raise awareness about the need to obtain legal authority for adults who lack capacity, particularly in 
young people who are aged 16 to 17 years old in order to plan in good time before they reach adulthood. So they plan to engage with other government departments, so financial providers, special education needs and disability schools, social workers and banks as well to help raise awareness of this. They have also been working with the Court of Protection who have now got an improved application process which is a digital process and this digital application scheme has already cut the processing times from about a year to two to three months so there has been quite an improvement but this is the reason why we wanted to share all this information in a webinar like today just to assist social workers when preparing young people for adulthood but also to support the social workers that are working with adults in their adult social services team who may not have an attorney or deputy in place already. So the Mental Capacity Act, I'm sure you are all aware, applies to all people over the age of 16 years who live in England and Wales and who may lack capacity to make all or some decisions for themselves once they turn 18. So this is why it's important that we're dealing with this during the preparing, to, preparing for adulthood work. We've seen children and adult social services doing great work in preparing children, young people and their families for support in areas such as health and social care, mental health, education, financial benefits for that young person, work and housing. But we cannot stress enough how this should also include how a young person's finances will work post adulthood and not just be limited to their benefits. So as mentioned, these are the things that we've seen with families that just have not been able to access funds for their loved ones. And we see it on a quite regular basis and they feel frustrated. There's just a lack of understanding about deputy ships. And we have this period of time where there's no access to funds for their young person, for their, you know, their child. Or sometimes if they're a family member and it's an adult that we're dealing with and they don't have a deputy ship application in place yet, then, you know, they're sitting there and frustrated where they can't pay for care fees they can't access funds to pay for utilities or personal allowance and so we're just seeing this constant frustration and lack of understanding of the court of protection so what can you as professionals in social services do to assist clients and their families I really, really want to stress the importance of including the financial management in preparing for adulthood information. Um, if they will not have capacity when they reach 18, then consider the deputy ship application. Abby, one of my colleagues, is going to be talking about that shortly. And if they do have capacity at 18, then consider a lasting power of attorney. And my colleague Hannah will talk you through this shortly too. Thanks Chantelle. So hi guys, as Chantelle said, my name is Hannah and I'm a court of protection paralegal in Lincoln. So the first thing that I'm going to talk through is being DWP appointee. So if someone is unable to manage their benefits themselves, a friend or relative can apply to be their DWP appointee. So this will mean that they're responsible for making and maintaining the person's benefits claims. They will be the one signing the benefit claim form, telling DWP about any changes which will affect the level of benefit that's awarded. The appointee will receive the benefits, the benefit money directly into their own account and then spend it in the person's best interests. So the important things to know about this are that a DWP appointee can only manage the funds that derive from benefits. There can only be one DWP appointee for each client, but one appointee can act for multiple people. So, for example, a parent could be appointee for both of their children, but a child cannot have both of their parents as their appointees. And to become an appointee in this scenario, an agent from DWP will initially visit the person who needs the benefits to make sure that an appointee is necessary. And if so, they'll then visit the person who is applying to be the appointee. And during this, the person applying to be appointee may be asked about their own income and savings and any health conditions that they may have, which could affect the appointment. So this is all just to determine their eligibility to act. 
Some parents or guardians may already be appointed as DWP appointee and feel that this is sufficient rather than having to go down the lasting power of attorney and deputyship route. But the important thing to remember is that if the person that they're appointee for has income coming from elsewhere, so like from private pensions, from investments, from wages, from part time jobs or anything, they'll not be able to manage or spend this. They can only manage the benefit money. So it's a good idea to keep the idea of the lasting power of attorney or deputy in the back of your mind as your client gets older, because their needs might change as they grow up. They might get a job. They might have more money to invest in things. So the income might change and it might render the DWP appointee unable to help. So. Moving on from DWP appointee, the main thing that we're going to be looking at today is there's two main routes. So I'm going to talk through lasting powers of attorney, which we call LPAs, and then Abby is going to talk through deputyship. So which route you follow is completely dependent on the person's level of capacity. So as Chantel mentioned, if they do have capacity, then they can make an LPA. But if they don't have capacity, then deputship application will need to be explored as soon as possible. So if you work in child social services, it might be good around the age that the child is 18, sorry, 16, to start discussing this with the parents. So LPA route. So as I said, if your client has mental capacity, they can make LPAs. In terms of terminology, the person who makes the LPA is called the donor and the donor appoints one or more attorneys who are people that they trust and the attorneys are required to act in the donor's best interests. So I'm going to explain through the LPA route, like I'm the one putting an LPA in place. So I would be the donor and I would be appointing my parents as my attorneys. So there's two types of LPAs that everyone can choose to make. You can make one or both of them. The first type is health and welfare. So if I made a health and welfare LPA, it would allow my parents as my attorneys to make decisions about my daily routine, my medical care, my living arrangements and life sustaining treatment. The other type of LPA is property and financial affairs. So once somebody has turned 18, it's really important to remember that it's illegal then for parents or guardians to help manage their child's money as soon as that child turns 18. So if I put this LPA in place, it would allow my attorneys to collect benefits for me as with DWP appointee, but it also means that they can manage and spend all of my money, not just my benefits money. They can talk to my bank on my behalf and buy and sell property for me. They can pay my bills and so on. So this is what the front page of an LPA looks like. Um, it's obviously a property and finances one, but the health and welfare one is no different. It just says health and welfare at the top instead. So to complete the first couple of pages, all you need is the donors and each attorney's full name, date of birth and their address. So how should your attorneys make decisions? If there is, this isn't something that you need to fill out if there's only one attorney being appointed, but if you're appointing multiple, then like in my case where I'd be appointing my mum and my dad, I would have to decide how I want them to make decisions. So the most common and the most practical option is jointly and severally. This means that attorneys can make decisions both on their own and together. The other option is jointly. So that means that my parents as attorneys would have to agree on all decisions. Um, and if one were to pass away, then the LPA would just completely stop working and the other attorney who's still alive would no longer be able to act under it. So when can your attorneys make decisions? This is a question on the property and financial affairs LPA. The donor must decide when their attorneys can make decisions. Again, there's two options and the most common and practical option is as soon as the LPA has been registered. The other option is only when the donor has lost mental capacity. So my parents, as my attorneys, would likely be asked to prove that I, as the donor, lack capacity before they're allowed to manage my finances if you choose that option. So that's why most people go with as soon as my LPA has been registered. But this isn't a question on the health and welfare LPA form because attorneys can only act under a health and welfare LPA once the donor has lost mental capacity. So this is only an option on the property and finances one. So life sustaining treatment. 
this is obviously only on the health and welfare form, not to do with property and finances. So the donor decides whether to give their attorneys authority to give or refuse consent to life sustaining treatment. So there's two options there. So option A, that you do give the attorneys authority. Option B, that you don't give the attorneys authority. So preferences and instructions. This is on both types of LPA. So it isn't required to do, but the donor, if they want to, can choose to tell their attorneys how they prefer them to act, or they can choose to give them specific instructions that the attorneys must follow. For example, my granddad has put preferences in his health and welfare LPA that he has care at home for as long as is practical and doesn't move into a care home that he gets the Times and the Telegraph delivered daily, that he likes lager and good red wine, so he wants that purchasing and bringing to him whenever possible, and that he wants access to Sky, and particularly Sky Sports. So those are the preferences that he's put in his health and welfare LPA. So certificate provider. So for both LPAs, you need a certificate provider to sign. And this confirms that they have checked with the donor and the donor understands what they're putting in place when they're signing that LPA and they're appointing attorneys. So there's two types of people that it can be. It can either be somebody with relevant professional skills, such as a GP or solicitor. So we act as certificate providers for people. Or it can be somebody who has known the donor personally for at least two years, but it cannot be a member of the donor's family, a member of the attorney's family, or and that includes unmarried partners. So that's the end of filling out the form. You just have to sign it all, donor, certificate provider and attorneys all sign the LPA, and it can then be sent to the OPG for registration. So minimum age to do this, you need to be 18 or over in order to make an LPA. Time scales, the LPAs can be drafted and signed really quickly um, if you have all the attorney's details and everybody's there to be able to sign the documents. The length of time comes once it is sent to the OPG because they're currently taking a, about six months to register the LPAs. And remember that LPAs can't be used until they are registered and returned to you by the OPG. So there is that six month waiting period where once you've sent them off, they're still not in place yet, even though you've made and signed them. And in terms of costs, it's all to be paid by the donor. So there's an £82 registration fee for each LPA, which needs to be sent to the OPG. So if you're making both LPAs, that's £164, which needs to be sent to them. But you can apply for an exemption or discount of this based on whether the donor gets certain means tested benefits or if they have a low annual income. And also in terms of cost, if you want in solicitors to assist with the drafting of the LPA, acting as your witness, acting as certificate provider, registering the LPA with the OPG and then providing you with both the originals and certified copies of the documents that you can take into banks and things. Our fees at the moment are £600 plus VAT for doing this for one LPA and £800 plus VAT for doing this for both LPAs. So I'll now pass on to Abby, who's going to go down the debt ship route now that I've finished the LPA route. Thanks for that, Hannah. So hi, everybody. My name is Abby and I'm a paralegal in the Lincoln team. So I'm going to be going through deputy ship. So the first thing to say about deputyship, as Hannah mentioned, LPAs can only be made when the person has capacity. If it's determined that they don't have capacity, you would then need to look down the deputyship route. So a little bit of terminology before I get into the bulk of the application. So the deputy is the name of the person who is asking to be appointed and who will help manage the finances. And then in the application, the person who lacks capacity is normally referred to as P. And that is how I'm going to refer to them for the rest of the session as I explain the application. So there are different people that can be appointed as deputy as you can see. So the first one is family members. Um, so they tend to be the first kind of port of call from the court purely because they know P better, they've got a better understanding of their circumstances and they would know more how P would want them to manage their finances if they had previously had had capacity. 
The second option is professionals such as solicitors. So Chantal um, is a professional deputy for some of our clients. And um, the court tend to prefer this uh, to be an option when there's higher funds involved. So for example, if there's been a clinical negligence payout or a personal injury claim, they prefer for a professional to be appointed just because they've got a bit more experience than potentially a family member would do. The last option is panel deputy. This is kind of a last resort. The court don't tend to appoint these if solicitors or family members are willing. But in the case that they aren't, they will look to appoint a panel deputy. So a panel deputy is appointed to the panel itself by the OPG. And, they, they, and then they are invited to act by the Court of Protection, depending on how far they are from P. So they'll normally kind of look in their immediate vicinity and then work from there, depending on who is available. So as with the lasting powers of attorney, you can have more than one deputy and you will need to choose whether they want to be appointed jointly or jointly and severally, which is similar to the LPA. So jointly, you can only make decisions together with the other one present. So, for example, if you needed to go into a bank and there was three deputies, all three deputies would have to be present at the appointment. Otherwise, the bank wouldn't be able to do anything. If you were to be appointed jointly and severally, which is the more recommended option, as it does make things a little bit easier, um, you can make decisions, as it says, both together and separately, meaning one of you would be able to go into the bank without the other one having to be present. This is a much longer and more rigorous process compared to the LPAs, as the court wants to have a lot more information to make, for, make sure the appropriate person is appointed. So this is the, the COP1 form, and this is the initial form that sets out kind of who you are, what it is you're asking for, and it will ask you to list all of the proposed deputies. So if there is more than one, you will give all the information for all of the deputies. Um, it will also ask you to give details of solicitors if they are appointed. So all the documentation will go to them and all the communication will be done through solicitors should you choose to have that option. Um, it will also ask you to give kind of the basic details of P, so their name, their date of birth, their address and requirements should any court hearings be needed. Um, it's important to note that court hearings aren't that often in deputyship applications and you only tend to have court hearings, for example, if somebody objects to the applications or if the court feel that more detailed information is needed and they need an in-person meeting to go through this. So this is the COP1A and this is kind of the main bulk of the application. This is where it's going to ask you to detail all of the information about his assets, income, expenditure and liabilities as you'll see. So this is one of the example pages. This is kind of where it asks for some of the information. So it can ask things like, is there a will in place? What benefits do P, does P have and where do they come from? Do they get any income from trusts, investments, any other benefits or earnings such as part-time jobs or anything? Do they have any interests in estates? Have they ever been awarded compensation? Do they have any bank accounts and how much is in these bank accounts? Do they have any investments? Do they own any land? And what does their expenditure look like? So for example, care fees or any utilities that they may uh, feel are important. Um, so the form is used basically to make sure that the court are deciding that the correct person is being appointed. So for example, if they can see on all of this information that they've got a, a rather large amount in bank accounts or in savings, or they have investments, they may decide that a professional is better to be appointed and they may request this from the people that have actually applied beforehand. So this is a COP3, so this is the assessment of capacity. Um, this is quite an important form and without it, the application can't be made because the court needs to be absolutely sure that P does not have capacity before a deputyship is put in place. So this is filled out by the person completing the capacity assessment. So you guys as social workers could fill these out should you feel comfortable. If not, that's absolutely fine. We would look to speak to potentially GPs or independent social workers could be instructed. We would normally send the COP3 to whoever is completing the assessment with the COP1A, so the form that I've just showed you, just because it gives the person completing the assessment the chance to ask P about um, any of their own finances, just to keep this assessment more relevant and more specific. Um, it will also ask for the assessor to show that P um, lacks capacity, so it will ask questions kind of um, giving evidence of different criteria, which Keegan is going to go through later for the Mental Capacity Act. And it will also ask you to show 
if they are likely to regain capacity and um, the court may feel this is necessary in case there is a potential for them to regain capacity as it may affect their decision or they may want to put in certain restrictions or review points on it. Um, there we go. So the COP4 is, there is one COP4 for each deputy. So for example, if you're going to appoint three deputies, you would need to have three COP4s. Um, each deputy needs to complete one so that the court can assess each deputy on an individual basis instead of as a group. So the COP4 will go through the deputy's own personal financial circumstances. Um, they will look at things like debt, insolvency and bankruptcy, as these can affect people's eligibility to be deputy. Um, and towards the end of the forms, the standards that deputies need to agree to will be listed towards the end of the form. And they will be asked to say that they are willing to take these on before they sign in. So this is a COP15. This isn't the front page. This is a, a few pages in. Um, but we would send these out to three people that know peace. So it can be family members, friends, or if there aren't many of these in the individual circumstance, we can look to notify GPs, care managers, or you as social workers if you are involved. So as you can see, it will list the details of the application, who is applying to be deputy and what it is they're asking for. So in the bottom box, it will ask if there's any other orders that are asked to be made. So for example, if they were looking to sell P's property, they would need to ask for further authority to do this. And that is what they would put in that bottom box. So the COP 15s will need to be signed and sent back to solicitors. Um, but if anybody does object, they can both send it back to the solicitors and file it with the Court of Protection to say that they object and request that they be a party to proceedings. So the COP 14 is fairly similar to the COP 15, but this is used to notify P themselves instead of friends and family around them. So family members, friends, you as social workers or care managers can notify P or the person applying to be deputy can do it. This is basically just a conversation with P to say who is applying to be deputy, what that means and what that would mean for them. So we often understand that because P does lack capacity, this may mean that they aren't going to understand what is being said to them. And that is absolutely fine. The court just wants to have the opportunity for P to object should they feel they need to. Um, so the, pers the person who is notifying P will need to just detail what they've said in response to each of those questions. For example, as you can see, it kind of asks you to list the kind of conversation that you've had. Um, and if they don't have enough capacity to be able to understand what's going on, then that is what you would put in these forms. But again, the court just wants to make sure that they have the opportunity to object. So a little bit more information about the deputyship before I pass over to Keegan. So unlike the LPA, there is no minimum age for the person who lacks capacity in a deputyship. If you're kind of getting to the age where your clients are about 16 and it, it's, you know, for sure that they're not going to have capacity when they're 18, it may be better to look at a deputyship slightly earlier, just because when they do reach 18, it can, you know, the court processes can mean that there's a, a few months stretch where people can't access any of their funds, which can cause a few issues. Because um, as I said before, it is illegal to manage anybody's funds after they turn 18 without the proper authority in place from a lasting power of attorney or a deputyship. So we often say that the sooner the application is made, the better in terms of deputy ships, just because of the delays with the court. I know Chantel has previously mentioned that they have changed their processes, so hopefully it is looking a little bit faster, but that does only apply where there isn't a previous deputy in place. So if it's the first time you're applying, it's fine, it'll go through a new process. So once the COP15s have been sent out to people to notify and the COP14s have been sent to P and they've been notified, there is a 14 day waiting period for anybody to object and we can then submit to the court. And like Chantel said, I think we're estimating about two to three months for the court to get back to us with an order or to ask for any further information. So as you can see on the screen, um, in terms of fees, all finances involved in appointing a deputy are to be paid by P themselves, so the person who lacks capacity. So all of the fees are set by either the Court of Protection or the OPG. These aren't fees set by solicitors. So you have the new deputyship fee, which is um, £100 to be paid when deputies are initially appointed. You have £371 application fee to be paid to the Court of Protection when making the application. You have an annual security bond, which is a type of insurance that protects the finances of P and the person you're being deputy for. But this can differ depending on individual circumstances. So, for example, if P's got a lower estate, they haven't got as much money, the um, bond will be set at a much lower rate. 
So you've got the annual OPD supervision fee of £320 a year. So you can apply for an exemption or a reduction of this fee if the estate of the person who lacks capacity is of very low value. So in terms of solicitors fees, so if you're wanting someone to assist with drafting the deputyship um, application, communicating with the court and everything like that, Wilkin Chapman are currently estimating that our fees will be about 2,500 to 3,000 plus VAT. I think we're gonna pass over to Keegan now to talk about the Mental Capacity Act. Thanks, Abby. By way of introduction, I'm Keegan and I'm a solicitor within the Court of Protection team um, and I'm based out of the Grimsby office. I'm going to briefly touch upon the principles of the Mental Capacity Act before moving on to review deputyship management and the differences between a lay and professional deputy before passing back over to my colleague Chantelle. Now, Chantal previously discussed the Mental Capacity Act at the start of the webinar, and it's important to note that there are five principles within the Act that underpin both LPAs and deputyships, and I'll just briefly touch upon each principle. So principle one just is that there is a presumption of capacity for the individual. Principle two is the right for the individual to be supported when making any decisions. Principle three is that an unwise decision made by the individual is not necessarily to be seen as a wrong decision. Principle four, which arguably is the most important principle, is that the best interest of the individual must be at the heart of any decisions that are made. And finally, principle five is that any intervention that is made to the individual must be with the least restriction possible for that individual. So now what we'll do leading on from Abby's discussion surrounding deputyship is we'll just briefly look at how the deputyship management takes place, what's likely to be involved from the deputy's perspective. Now, once the deputyship order has been granted, the deputy assumes responsibility for the individual's finances and therefore must ensure that they manage everything accordingly. This can include a wide range of tasks and some of those tasks that can be included are noted on the screen now. So what it can typically include is looking after an individual's property, paying any household or domestic bills on behalf of the individual. If the individual is in a care facility, it can involve the payment of care fees, and it can also involve making sure that they receive any benefits that they are entitled to, and then also ensuring that day to day they have enough income to meet their needs. Now, as well as carrying out those tasks, there is also the mandatory duty of a deputy that they have to complete the annual reports for the OPG. Now to do this, deputies have to keep a record of all financial transactions that they undertake on behalf of the individual. And as I say, each year we'll have to complete a report and send this on to the OPG. Due to this, a deputy will need to keep copies of all bank statements of the individual, any receipts, any letters or emails or any correspondence that details any activity that's involved financial transactions. When it comes to complete the report, the relevant information is taken from these documents and then inserted into the report forms. Now, the report will also explain any decisions that have been made within that management year. And within that, it will include the reasons for the decisions and why they were in the best interest of the individual. It can also include who you spoke to when making a decision, such as if any third parties were involved, and also what was said during those conversations as to why they're in the individual's best interest and also the best interest of the finances of the individual. Now, all this does is it just allows the OPG to monitor the deputy's actions. It just ensures that the deputy is working in the individual's best interests at all times during the management year. Now, completing the reports can be a tedious task. There is a lot of paperwork to complete and evidence to provide. It's also important to note that when drafting these accounts for the reports, you need to ensure all the accounts balance to the penny. Now, we understand that this process can be quite daunting, particularly to newly appointed deputies, and therefore, if any assistance is required with drafting these reports, obviously we can assist with those. Now, as I say, the annual report is one of the duties of a deputy. There are other duties that are um, listed on the screen, but not limited to those that are listed. And they can include, for example, tax returns. So it is the duty of the deputy to submit any annual tax returns where appropriate for the individual. 
It can also include gifts. Now, there are specific circumstances where gifting is allowed, but it is important to note that there are also restrictions on what can be done without prior approval from the court. Now, it also mentions wills if the individual doesn't currently have a will or they may have a will that is filled, it requires changing or amendment. It may be necessary for an application to be made to the court for a statutory will. As I briefly touched upon before, it also relates to funding and benefits in which it is the deputy's duty to ensure entitlement to benefits and funding for care needs are explored and secured where appropriate. It can also relate to property, but this is dependent on the scope provided in the deputyship order as to whether there is authority to sell or purchase a property. Um, now, we are discussing deputyships in relation to property and financial affairs today. I know my colleague Chantal is going to briefly touch on health and welfare proceedings. Now, it is also important to note that any specific health and welfare decisions, in certain circumstances, it may be appropriate for an application to be made to the court for that specific health and welfare decision. Now, if we look to lay deputies or a professional deputy, as I previously mentioned, the range of tasks the deputy will be required to assist with is dependent on the size of the individual's estate and their range of assets. The extent of the individual's estate can decipher whether a lay deputy, such as a family member or a close friend, or a professional deputy would be the most appropriate to manage the individual's assets. So the best way to look at this is through case studies. So we will start with lay deputies. And for example, hypothetically, if we had an, say an elderly lady who was a permanent resident in a local care home, there could perhaps be a diagnosis of dementia. She may not own a property, she may have rented prior to going into care. She might only hold two bank accounts, one being a current account and one being a savings account. Both would typically perhaps hold quite minimal amounts. In this instance, it tends to normally be a family member or a friend of the individual who would be appointed as their deputy. And using this case example, this would involve making payments of care fees and managing the individual's two bank accounts. If the individual had been living in their own home, whether that be with support or without support, rather than the care home, then this would also involve making payments of any household or domestic bills. It could also potentially involve making small gifts on special occasions such as birthdays, for example, provided that the deputy, um, the individual, sorry, had made those gifts before during their lifetime. Now, as I say, in these instances, the court would genuinely favour the appointment of a family member, as ordinarily that relative or friend will be familiar with the affairs, wishes and feelings of the individual. They're also likely to be in a better position to consult and encourage them to participate in any decisions made that they are able to. Another factor considered by the court would be that costs would also obviously be higher if a paid professional is appointed rather than a family member, as a lay deputy cannot charge for their time spent in the performance of their deputyship duties. I will move on to discuss the charges of professional deputies and concerns raised shortly. Now, the above being said, it is imperative to ensure that the person selected has the necessary experience and skills to be an efficient and effective deputy. So now, if we review the other side of when a de professional deputy is likely to be appointed, typically this would be in cases that involve substantial assets. However, this could also be when there is ongoing friction between members of the family, there may be no family members for the individual, or there could be illness within the family, or any willing family members may not perhaps be able to take on the onerous duties of a deputy. So again, if we briefly look at a case study for a professional deputy, for example, hypothetically, if we had a younger client, say in his late 20s, 30s, may have received a substantial personal injury or clinical negligence award, then this may be an instance where a professional deputy is more appropriate, as this could involve the following. 
It could involve meeting with several individuals on a regular basis, such as multidisciplinary teams to discuss any care packages that are in place, whether that be in the individual's own home or in residential care. It will also include liaison with any health officials, advocates and anybody else who's required in order to ensure that the person's best interests are met. It could also include liaison with the OPG, um, members such as yourselves, the local authority and also DWP in relation to the handling of their benefits. In addition, we discussed that a professional deputy is more appropriate where there is perhaps a large sum of money. Where there is a large portfolio of money to be invested, there will be regular contact with the financial advisors and professional deputies will deal with investment paperwork, any investment income and again any tax returns as required. Now, dependent on the individual's current living situation, there could even be the potential of purchasing a property on behalf of the individual. This could be to ensure their long term needs are to be met. And again, this would install, involve a substantial amount of involvement with third parties, such as estate agents, architects, surveyors and other people in those lines of work. Now, as I briefly discussed before, a concern that may be raised to a professional deputy appointment is their ability to charge for the appointment. However, whilst it's acknowledged that there are ongoing fees for the payment of the management of the client's file, the court have set reduced hourly rates and rules that are, are adhered to by professional deputies. Now, where the prescribed fixed fees set by the court are perhaps overrun or exceeded by the professional deputy, any files and any work undertaken are usually sent on to the senior court's cost office for a full review and detailed assessment of costs. Now, all this does is this ensures that an external independent third party physically checks the work that's been undertaken by the professional deputy and also ensures that any fees that have been charged above and beyond the court set rates are a reasonable and also a proportionate reflection of the work that's been undertaken. Um, now, I will now pass you back to my colleague Chantal, who I believe is going to go on to discuss health and welfare proceedings. Thank you. So with preparing for adulthood, it tends not to include future decisions such as DOLE, Section 21A proceedings and legal aid and who may be eligible. So we feel that this would be beneficial to family members um, in terms of in explaining to them what's to come in the future, even if it's just a brief summary or potentially a handout um, explaining each of these to them. So I just wanted to go through this very, very briefly with you today in terms of the financial implications um, of each of these. So just to make things clear, if you're applying to be deputy for a family member in terms of finances, all the costs come from the person who's lost capacity. But if you're making an application or you're being joined as a party um, to health and welfare proceedings, you pay your own costs unless you are P or their relevant person's representative, otherwise known as an RPR. But I'll go through this shortly. So you'll all be aware of doles, but the issue comes when the decision is made to contest a standard authorization. So this is where we see Section 21A applications being brought before the court. But for a Section 21A application to apply, the person who's being deprived of their liberty has to be within a hospital or a care home setting to be eligible for legal aid, which I'll come on to shortly. The Court of Protection has a number of functions. They're there to decide whether or not he can make decisions for themselves. If they can't, due to a mental illness or a brain injury or um, deteriorating health condition, such as dementia, for instance, then the court will determine that they lack capacity. But that's one of the first things that they look at before they'll even go through forward with proceedings they want to know that P lacks capacity because if they don't lack capacity they have no, no jurisdiction over the, that decision that's being made. If the person can't make their own decisions the court will make the decisions in their best interests 
And like I said, the court cannot make a decision on behalf of someone who has capacity. So they will always, always want to see a capacity assessment confirming that they've lost capacity before they'll agree to do or look at anything. Once they've determined that P lacks capacity in the Section 21A proceedings, for example, they'll look at all the evidence before reaching a decision. This can include considering P's wishes and feelings about where they may live, um, or in, it may be about medication, or it could be about medical treatment that they're going to receive. They'll look at the views of other relevant people, such as family members. They might look at medical or social services records. They can sometimes give an idea about historic wishes and feelings, which is really handy if he isn't able to provide their wishes and feelings right now. Um, and sometimes they will look at having an independent expert opinion as well. From a financial perspective, what is it that you as a social worker really need to know? Um, so the court will always consider all the available options to pay. So specifically about 21A, Section 21A proceedings, they'll want to know, you know, is, is the care, current care home meeting their care needs? Is that is that something that they can remain it? Could they remain there? Could they look at an alternative care home? Are they asking to return home? Are they asking to move with a family member? Um, are they asking to be in, you know, community housing or something like that? So they'll ask, they'll look up every single available option to pay. And as a social worker, they'll want you to do a balance sheet in effect to look to actually look at what options are available for them. We, you would need to know and make sure that you're aware of the funding arrangements for P in each of those options. So could they could P be eligible for funding? It may be um section 117 aftercare funding for example it could be further nursing care it could be chc funding um it could be local authority funding as well if they don't have if they have limited funds so it's just to be able to understand what funding is there available you need to consider does p have enough funds to self fund or would the local authority agree to fund any of the options that p is asking for if they lack the funding may need to consider whether P has a house that could potentially be sold to pay for their future care needs or if P is asking to return home is there financial support that the local authority will provide um, and is that is that an option for them another thing to consider is is there a finance deputy or attorney in place that could potentially provide all this information to them as well in terms of who funds the costs of the application, legal aid could be non-means tested, which means that you would not have to earn under a certain threshold in order to be eligible, but you could get legal aid regardless of what you earn or what savings you have, however high or low. However, it's important to note that this non-means tested legal aid is only available if you're the detained person, so P, the person who lacks capacity, or their relevant person's representative. If you're not the detained person or the relevant person's representative, then you'll only be eligible for means tested legal aid. So this means that you'll have to meet certain income and capital thresholds, but normally this isn't an option that's available for most of our clients' family members because they tend to have over that threshold. And this is where we see legal fees increase significantly um, and the cost of fam it, it costs families a lot to go through doles or Section 21A proceedings. So whether you get non-means tested or means tested legal aid, in both cases, you'll have to satisfy a merits threshold as well. And this just means that you need to make sure that, or the legal aid will want to make sure that there's a valid grounds to be brought for this case. So in other words, there needs to be a 60 to 80% chance of success. Now, usually in cases such as Section 21A proceedings, this element's quite easy to demonstrate. So someone being deprived of their liberty is a serious matter and it will almost always be in someone's best interest just to check that the deprivation is lawful, particularly where they're objecting um, to where they're staying. So if we just have a think about how we can help in these situations, so you may come across family members who are looking for a solicitor and 
So you might not know their financial position, but in terms of the ability to get the support, a lot of people are concerned about the costs of solicitors when it comes to legal representation. So I just want to talk you through what we're able to offer just so that you're aware of what's out there. So we can provide full representation to clients, but there is a big cost implication to this. So I would only ever suggest this to family members who one, have the finances, and two, feel that they would struggle to manage the proceedings on their own. So costs for these proceedings can often be between 10 to 30K, depending on how many hearings there are or what evidence is being required. We can also represent at hearings only. So this means that all the correspondence before and after is taken out and we're only involved with the correspondence directly related to the hearing. Um, and it just means that the client has a little bit more control over our, final, our, our, over our fees. So in this circumstance, we may assist with preparing statements, position statements, potentially drafting orders if that's needed. Plus, we'll attend the hearing, do the pre-hearing um, advocates meetings um, or round table meetings, and we'll represent the clients at the hearing as well. In between the hearings, we would then take a step back and allow our clients to progress matters until the next hearing when we'd pop back in and get involved again. So for these types of this type of support, we can offer fixed fees. Um, and like I said, it does give the client a little bit more control over fees, which is, is something that they normally appreciate. We can also work on an ad hoc basis. Now, this is beneficial for clients who have limited funds, but also for clients who feel once they understand the process, the court process and what's involved, that they would be able to represent themselves in court. So sometimes client come, clients come to us because they just want specific advice like, how do I prepare for the hearing? How do I draft a witness statement um, instead of doing everything else that I've talked about? So in those circumstances, we can limit the time that we're involved so the client has even more control over the costs. So just to summarise on um, dolls and costs, not everybody is eligible for legal aid. I have recently had an increasing number of clients who ring and that's one of the first questions they ask is, can I get legal aid? Um, and it just isn't as, as available as some people may think it is. If they're, not if they're not eligible for legal aid, then costs can be high depending on the support that's required. And a lot of family members are just totally unaware of these costs. So it's really important for family members to be aware of them. Um, we were legal representative for two clients who were applying to be deputy. Uh, their brother contested the deputyship application and then raised issues about P's residence. So the judge then amalgamated the finance and the care proceedings together, meaning it was quite difficult financially to differentiate what between what was legal aid proceedings and not legal aid proceedings because everything was heard at the same time. So for the deputyship part of the proceedings, our client's costs were borne by P, but when it moved to the health and welfare proceedings, P no longer funded this because they got legal aid um, and our clients then became liable. So having an understanding regarding costs and somewhat, um, or someone that you can call upon for guidance is quite beneficial to clients if they're concerned about possible future hearings. So I'd like to thank you for attending today and we'll just see if there's any questions. I have answered some as we've gone through, but and I'll just quickly read them out so that everyone can see. Um, I know as well that I had had a discussion with a few people about doing more in-depth dolls training. If this is something that you want, then please do let me know. It didn't really fit in properly with the financial transition from child to adulthood. But if you're interested, just let me know and we can obviously offer that. Um, if you haven't asked questions and you wanted to, um, then you can please do contact me. My contact details are on the screen now. So I'll just have a look at some of the questions that we've already answered. So there was, is a panel deputy a solicitor? Yes, they are. Um, if the person only has a, an appoint, DWP appointee, but now has a substantial amount of savings from their benefits, 
um, would they need a deputy? And I feel this is really difficult thing to answer because um, it kind of depends on the finances. Now, the person who's asked this has confirmed that the finances is between between 20 to 30 K. And, this, and the point of the DWP appointee is to basically use their finances for their benefit and in their best interest. So I think as long as you're not moving money around or making financial decisions and you're just using it for payment of um, potentially bills, but I think if you're going down bills routes, I really feel that a deputy would be required. But if you're just paying simple things, I think a DWP appointee is still fine. Um, they've asked what's the difference between court of protection and the office of the public guardian so the the OPG register lasting powers of attorney and they supervise attorneys and deputies so if there are any concerns about the way that an attorney or a deputy is managing finances um, or sometimes when you get uh, conflicts between siblings and their attorneys one might bring the OPG and say the other one's mismanaging the funds and then there'll be an investigation um, so they do investigate concerns about how an attorney or a deputy are managing money they also review the annual report so where I'm a deputy for instance I'll submit an annual report and they would review that and scrutinize it and they might come back and ask questions about things um, and so the, the office of the public guardian is really there to um, supervise attorneys and deputies, whereas the Court of Protection makes decisions for P in their best interests. Um, another question was about, do you need to have a solicitor to complete a power of attorney or can the donor or attorney complete the form and pay the fees themselves? Um, so yes, it is possible to do a lasting power of attorney online. And if somebody is tech savvy, I would never hesitate to say that that's an option, um, particularly because finances, there's a big difference between having to pay our fees plus the registration fee or just the registration fee. But I do stress that we are seeing um, people who would then contest in the future. So say if you're appointed and a sibling isn't appointed for any reason, uh, then it could be that that sibling comes back and contests it. When you're doing it yourself, unless you have a capacity assessment for that time, there's no proof that that person had capacity when they made the lasting power of attorney. And it could be at that point that the court of protection step in and say, if there's a concern, they may discharge the attorney and then appoint a deputy in place instead. So if there's ever going to be any possible contest about capacity I would always suggest to go to a solicitor because a solicitor won't do it if there is concern that there's there's a lack of capacity so it just protects you um if there's three attorneys for a parent's finances is there such a thing as all three having to sign each time money or finance decisions are made so that could include simple things like shopping online banking so yes they can act jointly but like um, it's been explained earlier it's not very practical so say for instance if you need to go to the bank all three attorneys would have to be there to make a decision um, or to sign so it can make things very difficult so we always suggest that you only appoint attorneys or you clients would only appoint attorneys that are actually um that they trust will act in their best interest and that they'll liaise with each other as well um because it's just so important to have people that are that are there and um that you know are going to act in your best interests so is there any kind of mental capacity assessment undertaken to clarify capacity when the lpa is arranged not necessarily. So with the Court of Protection, you have to have that COP3 capacity assessment completed before they continue forward with the application. With the lasting power of attorney, if you came in to see me, for instance, and we were having a conversation, you could tell me about your finances, um, and I was happy that you had capacity, we would just proceed with the lasting power of attorney, and I would make a attendance note to confirm that I felt that you had capacity to do that. If I ever have any concerns, I would always ask for a capacity assessment to be completed first. But I do want to stress, we have clients who come in who have learning disabilities, um, or sometimes they may have some kind of brain injury. Other solicitors haven't touched the lasting power of attorney with a barge pole because they don't want the responsibility of it. But the way that we deal with it is quite different in terms of 
we really make sure that the person understands what they are um, what they're entering into with the lasting power of attorney so they don't necessarily need to know all of the background about their finances but they need to know do they have a house do they have a bank account um, if they know that and they understand that they're asking somebody to help them with that then I'm more than willing to look to see whether we can get the lasting power of attorney rather than a deputy ship and I would always offer that because that's a cheaper option it's now not the fastest option which it was previously but it is a cheaper option um, and so we do have clients that I had one previously who had the on onset of dementia and when we came to do the assessment of for, to do the not a capacity assessment when we came to do the conversation about you know do you understand what it is that you're signing she wasn't able to verbalize anything to me which was a real concern so I was saying okay no it has to be deputy ship the husband explained to me she does understand it just that she can't verbalize it so then we started looking at other options so you could have um, flip cards you could have pictures you could have the ability to write something down if it's a worst case scenario and they're in a hospital bed and they're not able to speak can they blink can they look left or right so we can look at saying can you look left for no or look right for yes there are ways of doing it so we just have to find a way that that person or the donor who's going to be the donor is able to express their wishes and feelings and for this particular lady who had dementia when I gave her our lasting power of attorney form to fill in to say who do you want to be as attorney what's your name your date of birth address and all the details of her attorneys she was able to immediately write it out but if I asked her that she just couldn't verbalize it so there are ways of of getting the lasting power of attorney in place we just have to make sure that we're happy I, I, if I'm signing a certificate provider I wouldn't do it unless I'm 100% sure that they have capacity and understand um is the decision assessed capacity to manage finances or capacity to agree an LPA so the decision isn't assessed unless I'm asking for a specific capacity assessment. So that's when I would say we need an independent social worker or potentially a GP. Um, we've had one recently where there's uh, the older people's team and the psychiatry team have been involved and they've done it. So it's not necessarily that, um, yeah, that it's assessed, but we, I would ask for a formal assessment from somebody else. So although we can assess on a general basis, just to say, are they able to converse with us? Are they able to understand what we're saying? We're not qualified like you are to be able to do the capacity assessments in depth and actually determine whether someone has capacity or not. So if we're ever unsure, then we'll always ask for an assessment. Is the RPR appointed where there is no family member to represent the person? Um, sometimes the RPR can be family members. Um, I think it just depends. So if somebody is... If you're going to be that person's RPR, you're putting forward that person's wishes and feelings. Now, if you are conflicted because you're saying, actually, mum's saying she wants to be in a care, uh, no, mum's saying she wants to go home, but I really feel she should be in a care home, there's not going to be a possibility for you to act and put forward their wishes and feelings. Um, so quite often there is a professional person that's appointed um, instead of there being an RPR. Uh, a family member as an RPR. So I'd just like to thank you all for attending today. It's been great to be able to, to do this. Um, and if you do have any more questions, then please do contact me and let me know. We are going to put the recording up on the um, on our website and I believe it's going to go on YouTube. So once I send out an email just thanking you for attending, there'll be a link as well, but it may be a day or two before that comes through. Um, so thank you so much for attending and obviously get in touch if you need anything.